Hello, everyone. Sounds like you all are having some great conversations. Um, so sorry our networking break ran a little short, but we have some amazing speakers still left to go, so we wanted to jump on in. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Amin Ra Mashariki, who is currently the Director of Data and AI at Bezos Earth Fund, who has worn many amazing, interesting hats up until this point, and is here to share a little bit about a tool called a data drill, which is something that you will find discussed in our online course, and we get to see today um, how this is being tested by some folks here in St. Louis part, as part of the re regional response team. So please lend a warm welcome to Amin Ra Mashariki. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. All right, let's uh, light this candle. I'm going to set the timer there. So um, I'm in Ram Mashariki. Um, if you can't tell already from my accent, I'm from New York. Uh, but also one of those roles that generals talked about was I was the chief analytics officer uh, for the city of New York and the director of an uh, uh, organization called the Mayor's Office of Data and Analytics uh, in New York City and uh, for the de Blasio administration, the first all of the first term and a little of the second term. Um, none d during COVID, so, so I got out uh, in time. But um, I'm gonna sort of, for the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna sort of have a conversation with everyone. I have slides, I don't like talking to slides, um, but I do have slides. Um, but we're gonna have a conversation, I'm gonna tell a story. And really, the, the core of this story uh, is about someone who was a relatively self-important individual that thought they knew everything about data um, and really uh, uh, was humbled um, and, and then had to think of and work with the city of New York to think of a new way uh, to bring data solutions um, to the city. And so, uh, you know, I, I, unlike I think a lot of folks in the world that I'm in, policy folks and so on and so forth, but all of my degrees, undergrad, master, and doctorate in computer science. So I, I thought I had all of this stuff figured out. You know, my PhD was in AI and so on and so forth. So I had this stuff figured out. Actually, not so much, right? And so I'm gonna talk about, as General mentioned, I'm gonna talk about this concept that we created in New York called a data drill. Um, and here's the abstract of it. And um, I was always taught to put the last slide first, right? And so I learned quickly in New York City, I don't have all of the answers. I don't even have most of the answers, right? But I had experiences. And everyone at the table, everyone in New York City, um, everyone here has experiences. So how do you create a space where everyone can apply their experiences to help solve um, really uh, intractable, and gnarly problems sort of using data, right? So what's a data drill? A data drill is an exercise in collective work and responsibility. Anyone who's familiar with Kwanzaa, I stole that from them. Uh, it, it is an exercise in collective work and responsibility to use data to solve urban challenges. Right? So I, um, I've tried, when I came to New York City, I tried a bunch of different things. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the company Palantir. They're a tech company based out in Silicon Valley. They're a multi-billion dollar valuation, well-known. All of the top venture capital firms have funded them, Peter Thiel and others. Big deal. We spent, my office spent millions of dollars purchasing a Palantir technology. It was called uh, pa uh, Palantir Data Bridge. And it, didn't, it was terrible. Didn't do anything close to what we had even hoped it would do, right? Um, and this is an actual headline, and you Google it, that article is still up, where uh, a, a reporter basically did this big investigation, which, and it basically was like, who knows why they spent millions of dollars for this tool and how they're using it. And all they did was give their data to Palantir. New York City gave their data to Palantir. It was a hit job, but... Um, uh, that was my first like really scary moment in New York City when this article came out. Um, they foiled the crap out of me and got all sorts of information. Still up, you can kind of see. And it was an unsuccessful venture. 
right? So I went to the other end of the spectrum and say, you know what we'll do? We'll do a data integration framework and we'll get all of the GCs from every single agency and get them in a room. We, we used to, there's this space in City Hall called the Cal. We got all of the general counsels from every agency and the CIOs and all of them to sign on. I literally was going ag literally agency by agency, visiting them, sitting down saying, hey, sign on to this data sharing agreement and strategy and the world is gonna change. Can anyone hazard to guess? And we, 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 we made this 60 page document that everybody signed off on. And I'll share it with you guys too. Um, can anyone hazard to guess how many people are following and using this data sharing strategy and agreement in New York City? None, that's right, none, nobody, right? That's what happens when you spend a year and a half of your life building a document that people could use and, and follow and an a internal city policy, right? Five years in, new mayor, two years in, nobody was using it, two years after I left. So, so we spent a lot of money with a vendor, that didn't work, spent a lot of money um, and time and political capital trying to convene people in meetings and sign offs and so on and so forth. That didn't work either. This is this quote that I love. Does anybody know who, who said this? Mike Tyson, that's right. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that's any urban data environment. You can think about all the things you wanna do and how you wanna do them and be thoughtful about it until the problem faces you you know, like face front, dead in your face, yeah, you realize all of your strategies and all of the things you put in place, you gotta switch them up. You gotta switch them up. And so today we're gonna talk about how the data drill really helped us engage. Didn't solve anything for us, but it helped us engage. To sort of level set, I wanna talk about a couple of things that intellectually we had to wrestle with the difference between research analytics and operational analytics. So I'll, I'll give a story to explain the two, because I love telling stories. So research analytics is, if uh, I currently live in Baltimore, so research analytics, and Paul always likes to tell me Baltimore is very similar to St. Louis, so I, um, is if the, the mayor says, huh, we're seeing a lot of instances in hospitals around children and asthma um, uh, and air quality. Uh, can Hopkins or Morgan State or University of Baltimore do an analysis of air quality in and around the city of Baltimore? Right, and they'll spend a lot of time, get a lot of data and think through all of that stuff. And then they'll put a heat map and you know, Baltimore City asthma hospitalization rates and all these different heat maps and nice visualizations. I worked at Esri for two years, so you know, I, I'm allowed to, take shot at maps. Um, now, operational analytics is, so when that entity gives that to the mayor and says, you got a problem, Mr. Mayor, Mr. or Mrs. Mayor, you got a problem. So then the senior advisors say, you know what we'll do? We'll ask the state. Now, Westmore is the governor, so maybe they'll get more money than they used to get. Uh, we'll ask the state, give us $2 million so we can buy asthma pumps and we can make asthma pumps available to these communities, uh, which are the two kidneys uh, in Baltimore. If you ever watch the wires, East and West Baltimore. Um, we'll get $2 million and we'll make uh, asthma pumps available to the children in those communities. Goes to the state, asks for the funding. The state says, well, how about we give you $200,000? So now you have to purchase. So now the mayor says, I need to figure out if I'm gonna get a smaller amount of asthma pumps than I thought I did, I no longer have the luxury of just kind of putting asthma pumps in a box and giving them away for free or meeting people at the Orioles Stadium and giving them away for free. I have to be targeted and precise in who I get these pumps to, to have the right impact. So I literally need to know the addresses, the names, 
and the health situation of individuals so I can get these 200,000. I can't waste one single asthma pump. So Moda, tell me, the two, tell me how many pumps that I can buy and get them in the hands of every single person who needs them. Not one person should have a pump who doesn't need a pump. That's operational analytics. That's when you brought my office into play was when you needed to get something done and get it done with precision, efficiency, and low cost, right? How do you go from operational? This is, just, this is not even an exhaustive list. How do you go? You, you have to have access to hyperlocal data. So you got all sorts of privacy issues. Currently, New York City has a chief privacy officer. When I was there, New York City didn't have a chief privacy officer. We forced New York City to have a chief privacy officer because we were getting all sorts of health data and people's data to do also, I mean, we broke all sorts of HIPAA, to do all sorts of things, right? And so we actually had to steal Department of Health's privacy officer, which who ultimately became the city's chief privacy. She, she was amazing. She became the city's chief privacy officer, but we didn't have one until my office started to look for hyperlocal data about individuals in New York. And I don't know about St. Louis, but they didn't like that we were doing that too much, but we had to do that. You bring in the policy advisors, you need to know what policies exist, what policies you can create, what laws you can have to support, and so on and so forth. All right, analytics, so I coined these two terms. Um, I actually looked it up. There's a company like in the UK that has, is called Analytics in Motion, but at the time I was feeling really special that I made up these two terms. Um, so let me explain analytics at rest versus analytics at motion. The mental model you want to keep in your head is, in the medical field, you have a doctor. And that doctor has a family practice. And they're in the suburbs. They're in the suburbs somewhere. And you go and you visit that doctor. And that doctor has time to take your vitals and diagnose you and talk to you and ask you all sorts of questions. How have you been these last couple of months? And so on and so forth. And engage with you for 30, 45 minutes. Then there is the doctor that's in the ER that has, does not have a plan. Um, you come in with whatever it is that happened to you or happened to anyone in that space. You come into the ER and that doctor has to engage, right? They don't sort of get to say, okay, give me your three months history and who I haven't seen that before, uh, why don't you go to the other hospital, right? They have to engage. You have to move, you have to act in the emergency room, right? So analytics at rest, this is a picture of some NYU students uh, at, the, at CUS, uh, which is, I guess, like a sister program of, of this one, Center for Urban Science and Progress. I think of analytics at rest as when the students have an analytics project that they need to, you know, they get a month, give them a month and a half to think about the data and find the data. Analytics at motion is, this is a true depiction of the time that my team, I got pulled in to respond to a Legionnaire's outbreak in New York City in 2015. The short of it is, we were literally living 16 to 20 hour days um, playing a role in getting data and doing modeling, daily modeling. Right? You don't just get to do one model and then you know, give it to your professor to review. Like We were doing nightly models, running nightly models to get out canvassing lists to emergency responders um, to check to see. And I'll, I'll go into the story a little bit. But that's analytics in motion. You don't have time to, to understand the, the data maturity levels of the data you have because the mayor requires two meetings a day, literally two meetings a day, on status update. So you can't say, well, Mr. Mayor, we didn't get the list out to Department of Health to go knock on doors because the maturity of the data was meh. You have to move. Um, and that's analytics at motion. So you got, there's certain rules that bound analytics at motion. You have to get better at data usage, data access, data sharing, and data retention. Um, the characteristics of data as an asset, you have to identify, you have to create a space where there's data as an asset. High quality data, um, there has to be a citywide data inventory. You have to know as much as you can know about citywide data. High data provenance, you gotta know where this garbage is coming from. You have to. It's, it's the same thing as, you know, 
if you're cooking a steak, you would like to know where that piece of meat came from or those vegetables came from and how long they've traveled before they got to your plate. You have to know that it, uh, uh, when you're doing analytics in motion because oftentimes if you throw garbage data in, um, you're gonna screw. I, I've told this story before. One of the scariest moments I've ever had in my life was in City Hall sitting across from the fire chief and we put out a list that day and every address we gave them was a bad address. And sitting across from the fire chief with the mayor on his left, deputy mayor on his right, and he's like, you and your kids are pissing me off because you're wasting my firefighters' time. They could be out saving lives and you're sending them to homes that literally don't exist. Stop doing it, right? And it was, it was like, I felt like your fired is coming like right after that statement, right? But you, you, you can't say, well, okay then, but just give us a month. You have to come up with a model and a way to respond and move. So this is the Legionnaires outbreak. These are um, real headlines. Um, and so when you think about a data problem in a city, you want to have to start with the city leadership question. City leadership always has a question. A data problem in a city doesn't start from a data question, doesn't start from a, all right, well, let's take this data and build a model to blah, blah, blah. You have to start from a city question. The city question is, where are all the commercial cooling tower systems in New York City? So in 2015, um, um, people started in the Bronx uh, were diagnosed with um, Legionnaires. And, and then it took about a day or two to figure out that Legionnaires was coming from um, cooling towers, that uh, there's standing water inside these cooling towers. And then if you've ever been to New York City on a hot summer day and you're walking around and you feel like a mist on your face, that's coming from the cooling towers. And so people were getting that and then getting Legionnaires disease. So when that happened, they convened us all in City Hall and the mayor had two questions. Anybody know, has it a guess at the two questions the mayor had? The first one was, what the hell is a cooling tower? <laughs> no, no one knew what a cooling tower was. Fire department knew and Department of Finance. Um, I'll tell you why Department of Finance. The second question, well, where are all the cooling towers? So if cooling towers are what's causing people in New York, so at this point in time, I think there were like seven people who died and 27 who were diagnosed at that time. It ultimately ended up to be 187 diagnosed and like 24 people died. Um, you could tell this is like seared into my brain, like these th three and a half weeks are seared into my brain. And so the next question was, where are all the cooling towers? And so I remember this, which is, I told you, I was gonna tell the story. Um, I was driving, I was driving actually to Baltimore. It was a Friday a beautiful sunny Friday and I was driving to Baltimore and I got a call from my chief of staff and he was like, uh, you need to come back. City Hall is asking for some data. What happened was um, all of this was happening and the mayor was like, well, where are all the cooling towers? Someone at the fire department said, well, anyone who has a cooling tower on their building could apply for um, a tax write-off to have that cooling tower on their building. So Department of Finance, which manages that data, but it's not exhaustive because just because you have a cooling tower doesn't mean that you apply for a tax write-off. You could get a tax write-off. So then they got this data set from Department of, so they asked the Department of Finance C, CIO, hey, can we get your data? Department of Finance CIO was like, Moda has way better data about Department of Finance than we do. Why don't you ask them? So then they asked, they, they called my office but the problem was Department of Finance only has information about the building, not information about the owner of the building. So then we had to take another data set that has information about the owners of the building and integrate those data sets to come up with a list of people literally to call that Friday and say, you need to get your cooling tower clean because it may have Legionnaires in it. But no one other than my team knew how to do that. So, they, so everyone at City Hall started to call my office and I'm on the New Jersey Turnpike about to have an amazing weekend. <laughs> Turn around, come back in, and so we create that first list. And at that point, 
that's when everybody knew like this was a bigger deal than we thought it was because there were so many people with cooling towers um, that we didn't realize had cooling towers and this is not an exhaustive list. Now the other thing is, the day, I, always just, I always say, uh, I don't know how it is here in St. Louis, but in New York City, um, our city council, their love language is laws. Like that's the only way they know how to communicate with the residents. And so I think like two days, they passed a law that said everyone in New York City has to have their cooling tower registered and cleaned. So then, I mean, that's the whole canvassing. So this, this view is that whole canvassing picture because we had two weeks. Because uh, at the end of those two weeks, then Corporation Council, which is New York City's lawyers, were then told to sue any building owner who did not clean and register their building. So, it, I mean, this was like a, a thing. And my office was in charge of that. Getting that data, doing, that, doing the models, predicting, w telling them who we thought had cooling towers. And so, remember that big city question, right? Where are the commercial cooling tower systems in New York City? Our answer was a machine learning model can correctly identify a building with a cooling tower eight out of 10 times. The two times we were incorrect, we heard about it every time. <laughs> Um, compared to one out of 10 times without using uh, analytics. Um, and so we used a bunch of models. Uh, it's called an ensemble method. And we connected a bunch of machine learning models. Um, and we did cheat a little bit. We brought in uh, a consulting firm to help us out because I had a small team, very small team. All right, so the problem, yeah, I gave you the short version. It was the worst three, four weeks of me and my team's life in New York City. At the, I, I dealt with, um, I had a very young team, uh, and I mean, they were cracking under the pressure of these city officials who were very aggressive. And this was all in the papers and so on and so forth. So we were thrust into the spotlight. And I told my team, just, they had to stagger it, but I told them each to just take a week. Don't charge it to vacation. Just take a week and just disappear. We'll cover you. So I gave each, because I mean, it, 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 was, it, it, it was terrible. The experience was absolutely terrible. We, we probably, you know, violated a bunch of HIPAA laws, FERPA, I mean, just the whole nine yards, but we had to move and no one was giving us space not to. And I realized data becomes important in how we respond um, and solve problems in a city. We need to be as thoughtful about using data as we are thoughtful about emergency responders responding to any type of problem. So, Emergency responders have, they do drills, right? Um, operational exercises, tabletops, functional drills. This is a picture of an operational exercise in New York. I mean, they, they actually go and test their capacity and test their capability uh, on a weekly, monthly, many, diff many scenarios. This is a tabletop exercise. A tabletop exercise is literally, that's Tony Shores. He was the first deputy mayor when I was there. Um, this was the office, he's sitting next to the uh, Commissioner of Office of Emergency, uh, uh, OEM, and, and a tabletop is essentially uh, this uh, consultant entity comes up with this big city problem. Oh, it's snowing and um, the Brooklyn Bridge has collapsed. I just made that up. They don't put that into the city problem. But some, all of these things went wrong in the city and all of the agency heads are sitting around that table and then they go around the table and they ask each agency head, what are you gonna do? Oh, well, we'll do a press conference and we'll close schools for two days, not one day, and blah, blah, blah. Right, and, they ha and so they work through how the agencies are gonna coordinate to respond. A lot of agency heads there don't get along, don't like each other, don't normally work with each other. There are a lot of things to work through. So why don't we do the same thing with the data scientists and the data teams across the city. Let's do the same exact thing. Bring them to the table, have them talking to each other. Because in the other example, all of the agencies sent the data to my team, a team of six at the time. All of these agencies were sending their data to my team. And as everyone here knows, you can assume, you can presume none of that data uh, integrated with each other in any thoughtful way. I mean, people had, um, by the way, it, you know the worst thing ever invented was macros in an Excel spreadsheet. 
Never send an Excel spreadsheet to someone with macros in it because there's nothing you can do with it. Rather, it just be a plain, comma delimited file. Um, so we would get all sorts of stuff. But now let's have the agencies work together, figure out what's going on. Not to solve problems, but to understand who we are, how we work together, what we all bring to the table, what are the challenges that keep us from working together. Let's work those through. What's a process by which we engage? Let's work that out in these drills, right? So this is a picture of exactly that, right? Decidedly, you know, less august than this, but it is the data teams of the city coming together over lunch. That's how I was able to get them together because you know, we were city officials, so you couldn't take too much time. So I bought everybody pizza and said, hey, let's do an hour and a half lunch, and let's have a big problem, and let's work together and see how we, what data each agency has to share with each other and how we would share, what we would share, when we would share it, in what order. What are, are there any HIPAA concerns in sharing with each other? Work those out before the emergency so we can at least have a process and a way by which we work together. So that's, so scope and objectives, this is all, um, I think they're gonna be sharing these slides, right, Jen Rose? So I'm not gonna uh, burden you with sort of the details here, but these are all sort of data drill steps. You do, um, so objectives of a data drill, you can have a specific scenario, you can have, it can be capacity building, um, you can build uh, operational capability. You can test new technologies. These are all of the different objectives of a data drill. Um, you can have, uh, so here's the core process. You have an interagency data call. Um, you upload the data. You do an analysis, and then you do a final convening. So there's two convenings, one at the beginning, one at the end, and then data work that's done. In the, in, um, and so here's an example of a scenario that we used. Right? After we go, so we use real, true scenarios to test out our ability to share data. Right? And so this one was a, a replication of something that had happened years prior. There was an a, a, a outage in um, Brooklyn, uh, area of Brooklyn. And so we wanted to uh, replicate that problem. Uh, an earlier speaker talked about utilities sharing data. Everybody always wants utilities to share data but nobody ever really gives the utilities the reason to share data. In this instance, our data drill, we actually brought utilities to the table because they didn't want to share data with us, but we showed them how certain pieces of their data could help solve really, really scary problems for the residents. So we gave them an opportunity to understand the value of them sharing data and actually brought them to the table as opposed to saying, hey, no one cares about your problems, share the data though, right? We brought them to the table, and so my office, I don't know what they're doing with it now, but my office, we had a stream of utility data after we did this specific data drill. Um, so the question that's being asked, remember, there's always a city leadership question. How many elevators are down? Because the city does not, I, I, this is the biggest, the most important part of data in cities. Nope. Whether you're a nonprofit or a city leader, you don't have a data question. You have a challenge that needs to be addressed. Their challenge was, during this blackout, how many elevators are down and can we quickly route emergency vehicles to the needed locations? That was their question, right? Nobody from City Hall is gonna come and say, hey, uh, that machine learning algorithm, do you think it's gonna give us a prediction of 44% over, eight? You know, like, no. This is their question, and they want you to solve it. So you have to turn that into a data question. So the data question for us was, what buildings are most likely to be down? Um, identify those buildings, and then how do we route vehicles? So this was our integrated building master. We created this document. This is a true document that we created with these data sources with the people in the room. This would not have happened if the people were not in the room, and we created this integrated view of buildings, and the way you read it is from left to right. This, we actually, the other thing about a data drill is we created this tool. It's just a spreadsheet, but we created this tool. Why is that important? It's because, you, you know in cities, they use this term of, called vendor lock-in. So, well, we don't want to just use one technology because we're gonna get vendor lock-in. There's gonna be vendor lock-in. 
what happens is when an emergency happens and they're all required to talk with each other and engage with each other, they all have different systems and they're all used to different stuff. So yeah, you don't have vendor lock-in, but now nobody has a consistent communication mechanism. So we created this. And so everyone at the table, all of these agencies, the emergency response agencies, all know how to read this, right? And all it is, it just says, from the left, if you've got all of the buildings, then you break them down, buildings with elevators, then you break them down, there's buildings with higher than six floors, less than six floors. You see how we're sort of breaking it down to the buildings we need to worry about so that we can predict which ones to go to. Then if you've got, if you've got a generator, we're not gonna send an emergency vehicle there. But if you don't have a generator, there's 276 buildings that are likely, um, that don't have elevators over six floors and without a generator. That's the group of buildings we want to send emergency vehicles to, to knock on doors, right? Kind of makes sense. But the data, we wouldn't have known that. That doesn't exist anywhere until we integrated all of this data. That's a visualization. I like maps. So we had this integrated building master, blah, 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 blah. But here's the funny part. Here's what happens in data drills. We have three different views of a particular building. If you notice, the number of floors um, and uh, levels are different for each. Because each building set from each different agency recorded floors and levels different. So for instance, fire department when they count how many floors are in a the building, they don't count the basement. They count up, right? Um, Department of Finance counts all for all sorts of tax reasons and air rights and so on and so forth. They count everything from the, no, I think I have that backwards. I think fire department cares about basements, Department of Finance doesn't, right? See, I'm even confused. So, so even they have different names, levels, floors, so on and so forth, and then different numbers. We, we literally, during the, this is a real photo of that building, during the data drill, we actually went to the building and took a picture to count the figure out, and even the building itself didn't have the same number of floors that were even in the data. Right? But this is what data drills help to expose. Your quality of the data but guess what? You don't have a right to the quality of the data. It is what it is. You still have to respond and you still have to move. But one of the things, this is just a small view of what we learned um, in that data drill, which is, hey, we have to be thoughtful when we integrate and we have to ask a lot of questions because there's no um, data set that just tells you the complete picture, right? And so there has to be conversations when sharing this data. So, Data drills are about, not about solving your problems, they're about creating this environment for communication and process development and understanding the different um, um, idiosyncrasies of the different types of data and also the different idiosyncrasies of the people who own the data. I'll, I'll say two, two, two quick things, I'll make two quick points, which is, the first one is, um, you know, it's always so interesting uh, working with you know, certain agencies um, like Department of Health and other types of agencies because they don't like giving up their data at all. And we get mad at certain agencies when they don't want to share their data, or certain organizations when they don't want to share their data. Um, but also we have to remember that oftentimes those people who have oversight, who are stewards of that data, are told that if they don't protect this data with their lives, that it's gonna be on them if something happens. So if you go to um, Department of Children's Services, there's all sorts of things that happen when that data about these children get out. So when you have this super cool idea in this project and you're like, yeah, we need data from Department of Children's Services, and they're like, no, buzz off, then we get mad at them that they don't wanna help us solve all of these big problems. But we have to understand the space that they're in. And data drills give people the platform and the space to share that and have that kind of conversation. The second is, one of the other things we learned is that, you know, for a long time, and I think I still, you, you, people still talk about siloed, siloed data, we gotta get rid of silos, we gotta get rid of silos. Data loves silos, 
right? The, I, the example I use is when you come home and you have a pile of mail, don't you start putting it in different piles? Like, here's the junk mail. Here's the mail I gotta like, respond to today. Here's the mail I'll get to, and here's actually the fun mail, like uh, wedding invitations and so on. You create silos. We have to be thoughtful about silos are important for any number of reasons, privacy reasons, all sorts of reasons that silos are important. For a long time, there was this clarion call of, we got to bust the silos, get rid of the data silos. No, 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 no. Data silos are important and are key, especially in helping uh, social services and helping people, keeping certain pieces of data. I'll give you a quick example. I know, I know I'm over time. I'll give you a quick example. I remember doing this integrated data uh, project. That's the good thing about not working for the city anymore and being super removed and the mayor not being liked as much anymore um, is that I can kind of tell some of these stories. So we were doing this project where we were trying to integrate education, data from Department of Education and data from NYPD and all these different data sets because what they wanted to do was understand um, which students were at risk so they can provide um, intervention and services, all right? There was one, I remember being in this group and there was this one, and we were talking about integrating all of this amazing data, and there was this one teacher that was like, yeah, you know, that data set that you're gonna create, for this mayor and for this purpose, it makes sense, but you could have a new mayor that uses that same exact integrated data set to target which students to kick out of school. So be very careful about how you integrate different data sets. Also, we were doing an underground project to, to map the underground, and there are certain underground assets that if you actually integrated them, you would actually create a blueprint for where you could uh, inflict the most damage to the city, not by skyscrapers and overground infrastructure, but by underground infrastructure. So again, separated, keeping that data separated was actually quite important. But the data drills allow for the people who are stewards of that data to have conversations around the importance of integrating it without actually needing to spend millions of dollars of like integrating data in this one system that rules them all. Right? And so that, that's, that was the power of uh, data drills. I told you I was going to tell you tons of stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amen. Um, so we have a, what we have next is a quick activity. We're gonna hear from, in a moment, in a, in a few moments, we're gonna hear from the St. Louis Regional Response Team who's thinking about how to use this tool of data drills. Um, but we want you to think about like some version of this. And, and um, you know, you saw two pictures. You saw one formal picture in the room, the tabletop. That's maybe wherever you work, a data drill would feel like that. More likely, it would feel like that more casual lunch table where everybody's sitting around trying to think together about data. Um, but we just wanted to share a, a quick activity for you to think about and talk to others around you about. Let me just pull this up. Think about a data drill, how a data drill or a similar exercise would benefit your organization. This notion that you have a leadership question. How do we stop pe people from getting sick in the Legionnaire's disease example, or, or more specifically, how do we find the cooling towers? Um, and then what data would you need to address that question? And then who do you need around the table to get that data? You know, Amon gave these great examples of, well, this, you know, they have this data, but they don't have the people. Well, they have this data, but they don't have that. What, what, what kinds of examples of that do you run into in your work um, where by bringing people around t the table, you could um, practice your, build your muscles about thinking about data before it's an emergency situation. And one way to do that is to imagine, a, imagine that emergency situation that you don't want to get caught in where you don't have the data and then think, how could I prevent that problem by flexing these muscles? How can we start to build these muscles? So um, just take a few minutes to think about a leadership question you're trying to address that you need data and that who are the people that you could gather um, to do that. And then what are some of the benefits of bringing those players together and also some of the challenges, be it 
hey, they keep their data this way and they keep their data that way, be it they don't want to share their data, whatever those things are. And maybe you're already doing some version of this. So just think about how, how you can um, either continue that work or, or start that kind of work if you're not already doing it. And, and then chat with the person next to you about it, I suppose. Hello again. Um, I've been popping around and there's just some really great conversations in the room and I wish I could join all the tables, but the tables I did join were pretty great. So um, I am going to turn off the slides. This is not a slide type of a conversation per se, um, although when you need your slides, you let me know. Um, So I'm going to actually turn the floor over to Paul Sorensen of the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance, who's going to get us started and talk to you a little bit about how you're thinking about how you might use something like a data drill, how you might collaborate. He's going to talk about how this is being played out with the regional response team. So Paul Sorensen. Great. Thank you, Jen Rose. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for being here and, and sticking on through the, the, the best sessions we're at, we're at the end of the day. Um, so um, we all heard from, from Amen about uh, the, the power of a data drill and how he's seen it play out in, in New York City and Baltimore and in some other places. Um, and we started thinking in St. Louis about where could we apply uh, a similar approach of bringing multiple data actors together around a leadership question and really pushing on what data do we need uh, in order to tackle this in the most effective and equitable way. And of course, the first folks who came to mind as, as that uh, the question kind of popped up was the regional response team. Um, AJ is going to tell you a little bit more about the RRT. But what we felt like is that in St. Louis, right, it's important to take uh, a deep dive into one institution. And we've been doing that a bit at the city. And you'll hear from, from Yusuf in a second about it. Uh, but we also know that so many of these critical challenges are regional um, and are really going to take more than just the city or the county or others to dive deep. Um, so that's all the stage setting I'm going to do. Um, AJ, it would be great to hear more about the regional response team. Um, and I don't know, like, wh why you answered the call. And I was like, hey, I, I think y'all would be a good fit for this. <laughs> thank you, Paul. So I want to say again, thank you to the team here for the invitation to the regional response team and our partners, um, as we know how important data is in informing uh, the decisions that we make on a daily basis. So the regional response team was founded in March of 2020 um, by Dr. Jason Purnell to create a centralized system of crisis response um, to deploy uh, resources, crisis resources, or critical resources in a coordinated um, manner across five jurisdictions. Uh, that includes St. Louis City, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Madison, and St. Clair County. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, it was um, critical for us to look at areas that may have been, uh, who didn't have access uh, to resources. So we created uh, four campaigns. Um, that was the eviction prevention campaign, the PPE campaign, uh, vaccine education, and also uh, the unhoused campaign for our unhoused neighbors. And during that time, we recognized that data um, should inform the decisions that we make. Um, we also recognize that it was also during the time of um, an increase in eviction uh, filings um, due to those individuals who were unable to work. That led us to our relationship um, with Ptolemy, uh, Andrew Keeve, who is here today. And we, you, we were able to facilitate uh, mapping, real-time mapping, to look at those um, areas or those zip codes that were most impacted um, and that needed access to the resources that were available. At the time, emergency rental assistance was being um, ramped up, and there 
were about $24 million um, that were available to the residents. And so we wanted to ensure um, that they had access to those resources. So I'll turn it over to Andrew now, who will share um, how we've been able to successfully use the data. Thank you very much, AJ. Um, yeah, so th it's been a, uh, a, a wonderful partnership with the, the regional response team really since the end of 2020, when I think they pivoted their focus from PPE towards, towards eviction prevention. Um, and so we were engaged to try to help the region adopt a more proactive and, and really preventative approach um, to, uh, to uh, preventing homelessness and, and evictions. Um, and sort of core to that is, and, and our role is really how can the RRT and its partners, particularly the partners in the city and the county, uh, start leveraging data to identify some of the upstream indicators of, of housing instability. And so I think without knowing it, and probably in a far less professional manner, we did our own data drill um, and said, look, what data is out there that's going to enable the RRT and its partners to identify hotspots of, uh, of housing instability across the region? Um, and so, you know, we asked the question, what data can help us to identify at-risk households, right? Obviously, knowing when eviction filings and, and the status of those filings is, is super critical. Um, understanding who owns the property and who the landlord is of the property, because one of the things that we know from our work across about 150 cities across the country is that where you live is not necessarily an indicator, uh, at, at, um, is not necessarily a strong indicator of sort of housing instability. It really is who your landlord is and what are their, right? Because they're, they're business operators and certain landlords have business practices that, are, that rely heavily op upon eviction. Uh, looking at property sales and foreclosures. So we're uh, working, with, uh, uh, working with Yusuf's team in, in the city. Um, sort of this is a, a bit of an expansion of the use case beyond eviction prevention and into uh, mortgage foreclosure prevention and mortgage assistance. So how can we identify where homeowners are at risk of losing, losing their homes? Uh, property conditions, right? So um, understanding you know, indicators like code violations in the city, uh, indicators of, of, of the, the actual condition and, and where we're seeing uh, housing disinvestment. Um, and then COVID case counts, again, because at the end of the day, the RRT was, was formed in response to the, to the pandemic. And so uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine awareness, uh, vaccine canvassing was a big piece of, 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 the, of the puzzle here. <clears throat> now, the, the, the challenge here is that all of these pieces of data sat in different data silos. And I, I know uh, Amin was sort of preaching the, the, uh, the importance of, of maintaining data silos, which we, we absolutely agree with. Uh, but also it becomes a challenge when you have this data that sits across a bunch of different systems. And so what, what, uh, what we did at the, at the RRT was figure out a way to build an eviction prevention platform that basically integrated all of these sources of data together and then allowed us to really try to understand what is uh, the, the status of the eviction crisis and then do very address, do, do address level hotspotting and targeting to inform things like canvassing, outreach, ERAP distribution across the city and the county. And so first and foremost is, hey, let's know when and where evictions are happening. So this is data as of yesterday that there are uh, 8,629 active uh, eviction cases. That's actually not right. There are uh, 8,629 8, properties with an, with an active eviction case in the city and the county court system as of yesterday. Right? So when AJ talks about real time or near real time, this is information that's being updated nightly. Um, pulling from, uh, from the circuit courts uh, and, and housing courts in, across the city and the county. But really what's important is to catch those new filings early in the process. So if we look at this, there are 364 properties with a filing in the last month, right? And so what, what the RRT is able to do is basically direct cases and addresses to community partners who can actually do on-the-ground outreach um, and, and, and canvassing. Uh, there are 27 properties with a filing in the last week, right? And you can keep drilling down, down to the last, down to the next day. And so, one of the things we're doing with Yusuf's team around the mortgage prevention is uh, they're working with a number of community uh, partner, three three community partners. They basically split the city up into into uh, three sections uh, that are doing outreach for mortgage prevention. And so, we're able to actually just deliver an email alert to them 
every single day, every time there's a new pre-foreclosure filing on a property. So instead of waiting for folks to come to the city with this pool of money, they're actually directing outreach to be more proactive and preventative. Right, and so how can you use this to prioritize, prioritize outreach? Well, one way is, is to basically hotspot it, right? So you can do like zip code level heat mapping to identify, hey, where, are the, where is the center of the eviction crisis going on in the, in the city and the county? And all of y'all, I assume, are from, from the area with, with a few exceptions. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise to you, right? If you sort of overlay poverty, if you overlay a, a number of indicators of, of, uh, that you would think would be strongly correlated with housing instability, the heat map is going to look pretty similar to this one. But what's really critical is, is actually tracking this information in real time. So looking at like trailing two-week cases so you can understand where case counts are, case counts are rising. Uh, but also understanding the trends in, in eviction filings. So this is just a, the, 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 this is a trend line looking at eviction filings across the city and the county starting on April 1st, 2020. So like good sort of clean, like when, when the crisis started, you see obviously uh, filings way, way down uh, at the outset of the crisis, even though there was a moratorium, we're still seeing in line, so, something around 200 filings per, per month, um, even during April and May. And then obviously very quickly those eviction filings resumed to a level that was about 50% of where they were pre-pandemic. But then really the question becomes, how do you efficiently allocate the limited resources that the St. Louis uh, community has to target uh, at-risk households and at-risk properties? Because this eviction data that we're, in, we're ingesting, because we have address level information, because we're also able to pull in data from the city and county tax assessor uh, to really sort of pinpoint and validate these, th these addresses, uh, we can do things like target resources at, at the worst offenders. Um, so, again, if, if we look at sort of going back from uh, April 1st, 2020 to today, there were about roughly 8,000 properties with an eviction filing, represented about 18,000 evictions in the city and the county, right? That's a huge, huge problem, right, and very, very diffuse and dispersed across the city and the county. But if we start narrowing down, narrowing down and saying, all right, let's look at those folks with five or more, let's look at those properties with five or more evictions, right? So where, where are the landlords that have five or more evictions since the start of COVID? You start to get into a much more manageable number and you realize that 5% of the properties in the, in the St. Louis city and county are responsible for almost 50% of the evictions since the start of COVID. You keep drilling down and you can figure out that 1.4% of properties account for about one third of the evictions across the city, right? So this is just saying, show me, every property, show me every property with 20 or more eviction filings since the start of the COVID crisis. And so very quickly you get to 1% of your properties. So that's 123 properties, right? That, that, that is a very serviceable and addressable number of properties that are responsible for over 5,000 evictions since the start of the COVID crisis. 27 properties alone account for nearly 15% of the eviction filings across the city. Right, so these are your large multifamily operators um, that are, this is the sort of business model of just steadily processing eviction filings um, on a month by month and week by week basis. And actually, if you, if you actually drill down into those 27 properties, you're not talking about 27 different owners because you see a lot of the same repeat offenders across, uh, uh, across this. And so really you've got, I, I think that there's probably about 18 true beneficial owners, maybe 15 true beneficial owners so you've got a number of repeat offenders that, that, that pop up on this list. So in, uh, in March of this year, there was an article in, uh, in Bloomberg uh, City Lab about the Wolf of Main Street, which is the Monarch Investment and Management Group, and their practices specifically in St. Louis. And they called out the fact that they were among the leading um, uh, filers of eviction cases uh, across the city uh, and county of St. Louis. Um, and uh, for us uh, within the RRT, we actually had good insight to these folks uh, months prior to that, right? And so we're able to build what are called like landlord profiles. We're able to link those across those shell LLCs, right? So this is the Monarch, this is one of the Monarch Group's controlling entities here in, in, um, in the city and the county. We're actually able to link them to 30 other controlling entities across the city and the county I don't know if you can see the small here. And so they're responsible for 773 ev eviction filings um, uh, across the city. And again, this is their business model. And so being able to track and understand, hey, when do these folks actually acquire new properties, right? And so this is the importance of having a, a, a real-time data centralization tool so you can track when these folks acquire new properties. 
Um, one of the things we've been talking a lot about with Yusuf is there's a, there's a single family rental operator called Vinebrook Homes that's again, one of the uh, pretty frequent filers that, that we see across the, the county. They own about 1,700 single family rental properties across the city and the county. Um, if you put those on a map, heavily concentrated up in, in North County, one of the things we've seen since the start of COVID is they've begun concentrating their purchases in Southern St. Louis, so, Southern St. Louis City. Um, and so again, being able to have a, a tool to understand, hey, this is a predatory landlord. We have seen them leading the eviction, leading the, uh, eviction filings at, at the county level. Now they're acquiring properties in the city. And, and you know, I, sorry for the folks on the RRT because they've heard me say this a million times, but like their business model is to try to exercise monopolistic control over rent prices, which requires that they concentrate their purchases in a region. So when you see them buying one or two properties in Southern St. Louis, you know that's a harbinger of other things to come that they're going to acqu start acquiring more and more properties. And so then at the end of the day, we basically rolled all this up um, and we are able to do address level risk assessment to drive canvassing. So this is a model that, that, that uh, we built with the, the RRT where we basically just identified six different tiers of properties to inform canvassing efforts. Um, your tier one properties were properties that had a rent and possession eviction filing in the last month. Right, so you have a very clear indicator that this household's at, at risk. Your tier two had a rent and possession eviction filing in the last six months that was still in progress. Tier three was since the start of COVID. But then what we're able to do with that landlord linking tool is to then say, all right, our tier four properties are, <clears throat> excuse me, our tier four properties are properties that haven't seen a rent uh, and eviction filing, but are owned by one of our frequent filers across the city. Because I would make the argument, we can make the argument, that if you live in a home, right, that is owned by a Vinebrook Homes entity or a Monarch Group, right, if you live in one of these properties, you are very much at risk for eviction if you happen to fall behind on, on rent. And so your, your tier four properties were uh, properties that were affiliated with some of these landlords, uh, and then sort of the, 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 the tiering goes down. And so what we're able to do is then put these on a, dur during a canvassing drive, we're able to put these on different, um, uh, schedules, right? So your tier one properties, somebody's going out there every single week until the, somebody actually answers the door and you could connect with the at-risk household, um, all the way down to your tier four because you have limited resources, you're able to say, hey, like we're gonna put, the, put these folks on more of a preventative watch and go out and see them every two, three months. And so what's, what's next for the RRT, right? Um, as I said, we've, um, with, with the help of uh, these folks in the room, with the help of, of the Regional Data Alliance sort of directing us to data that's available, we are able to pull together a sort of beta version of this tool. Uh, but as uh, AJ looks to sort of realize her, her vision and Erica's vision of a more long-term role in, in terms of present, uh, preserving housing stability versus just reacting to an eviction crisis, we think, all right, what are the additional data sets that we want to incorporate, right? And so it's where have ERAP dollars gone? Where has rental assistance gone? Because we want to understand the, the different, the gaps, right? Where we know we have an eviction issue, where we know we have an eviction challenge and dollars haven't flowed yet. <clears throat> we want to understand where naturally occurring affordable housing is, and that's a real challenging one. We could speak for a half hour or an hour about sort of how you actually target that. Uh, but also, I, mean, we were, I was having a conversation with Yusuf outside about just getting data on where the federally subsidized affordable housing is, where you see vacancy, where there are units available, because you've got excess supply and very much a demand. Uh, looking at things like housing choice vouchers, right? So understanding uh, uh, from a, the housing uh, authority standpoint where housing choice vouchers are deployed and some of the conversations we've been, been having with them or luckily not me, but Eric and, and AJ have been having with the, the housing authorities is, wouldn't you wanna know if you are placing somebody in a house, in, 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 a, uh, in a property that's owned by a landlord that's on our radar as being a frequent evictor, right? You're basically putting this person at a, at a peril, in a perilous situation. Uh, and then things like utility arrears, right? So the goal is how do you get further and further upstream to identify indicators of financial distress and housing instability before they manifest themselves in an eviction filing and, and ultimately homelessness. Yeah, and then lastly, what, is the, what, what other data sets are available and from the city and from the county that can help to drive some of this work? And, and Yusuf has been spearheading partnerships and trying to, trying to pull in additional stakeholders from, from the city to try to pull some of those in to create a much, more, um, a much fuller picture, um, again, to help the RRT realize its, its, its long-term goal of uh, ensuring affordable housing for anybody who needs it in the St. Louis region.
And with that, I'll toss it to Erica. I knew I should have went before Andrew presented. The most interesting pieces are looking at the data and seeing what we are able to do with that information. So having the ability to look at, Andrew is not from St. Louis, so he cannot say bum and trash and slum landlords that constantly are putting our residents out who are filing evictions and our folks have no place to go. The weather is changing. We you know, understand that homeless numbers are also increasing. So how do we leverage the data that we have to be more responsive and proactive in how do we navigate? How do we prioritize and how do we identify partners who need to be at the table to help deploy resources that are stacked so that we can have a comprehensive approach to really addressing the current needs that our community is facing? So with the role, we've really assessed of, uh, an uh, asset mapping of how many organizations have raised their hand to say that they are working to uh, eliminate or minimize eviction in community. And what are you actually doing in that space? How can we partner? Where is the handoff? Do you have resources? Are you working in the legal aspect? Are you working to find new placement? But what, what is your actual role and how can we assist you in that effort? How do we bring folks to the table to talk about true partnership, collaboration, and real opportunity? It is important that there's a willingness to share what's happening. There's accountability around the table and transparency of some of your programs are working and some of them may not be as effective as you potentially think that they are. So if the real goal is to help and to service people, then how do we make sure that that is what we are actually doing? And utilizing the data to help us get there. So the data helps to inform what needs to happen. I would say that bringing folks around the table has not been easy. Um, from those who know me from my previous work from Promise Zone is always check your agency at the door. It's about how do we address the issue at hand. And so that is the same for this uh, opportunity as we think about city and county and other organizations who needs to be at the table who's already collecting data and what data can help inform this long-term strategy of a coordination of resources that is what is necessary for service delivery so we are spending tremendous amount of dollars in the same geography that doesn't make sense when we recognize that we have multiple communities that look the same whether you are in um, North County or North City or you in South City, the numbers and the poverty numbers are the same. So how do we ensure that we are looking at that from a, a lens that is equitable for all residents in this region? It's also um, important to note that we've brought utility partners to the table to say, how do we leverage data that you already collect to layer on what we already have? So we know that there's utility, utility assistance dollars that are happening in the region, and then you have residents who are in the arrears. How do we work to ensure that they have access and know how to apply for those funds so then their utilities are not disconnected? Easy, right? No, that's been a two-year conversation and we still don't have ink on the dotted line, but that is something that we've been working on. But it's working through the hard system challenges when you're trying to do something different, when you are trying to do something that is necessary. And as I'll say, organizations and those who want to dismantle some of the uh, institutionalized I'll say racism that has happened and inequities that has happened in our communities, you have to raise your hand to say you're willing to do the hard work. You're willing to get in the room. We can fight it out. We can argue. We can curse. But we're going to figure it out. And then we can walk and out and go our separate ways. But people get serviced. And that is really the opportunity that has happened here at this table to say, who else needs to be here? What data do you have? Are you willing to share to layer on to this particular map? Um, in addition to that, we, um, you all recognize that there were um, emergency rental assistance dollars that happened. St. Louis County had 23 million, the city had 13 million. So you have that amount of money that is flowing in the region. We were able to see where those dollars were going and how did that also look contrast to where eviction filings were happening. We use that information to then go canvas and target communities, not go to Ms. Jones' house to say you're getting ready to get evicted, but to use that information to, try to canvas that entire neighborhood, that entire community to say here's an opportunity. Are you taking advantage? Do you need assistance with this application? 
And that's really what data does. When Paul asked the question, I said, why am I participating in the data conversation? Because that is not what I do. But strategic partnership and collaboration all day long. And the data informs how we show up. How do we strategize? How do we build something that is comprehensive, it is substantive, that allows us to prioritize the impact that we want to have on the region? And so that is what we've been doing. I'll turn it over to Yusuf to share how the city has raised their hand to say we want to be in relationship and partnership and also utilize the data to inform the work and how we position our resources going forward. And I'm supposed to follow. <laughs> so they stole all of the thunder. They gave you all the information uh, by raise of hands. How many people were impacted by the information, the data specifically that was provided? All right. By a slightly higher raise of your hand, how many people are from the St. Louis area or have been here for more than two years? All right, excellent. So you know that St. Louis is a parochial town. Uh, we have city, a county, and we have 88 municipalities in the county. Prior to coming to work for the city, uh, I've been with the city for about a year now. I was working in the county for about five years. And to Erica's point, herding cats and bringing partners to the table amidst all of that parochialism is not easy. So why does the data matter? It's because it centralizes the people that we are here to service. I'll say it again. It centralizes the people that we are here to service. And I say that because often that gets lost in these sort of conversations of minutia about funding and all of these other uh, thiefdoms. At the end of the day, and I see Isaac sitting there in masks. Isaac, raise your hand. So Isaac is a part of a group that helps us to gather data around the unhoused. And so while we've talked about this spectrum of need, some of which is around housing, people don't become over unhoused overnight. They start at some point of the slide downhill. And the extent to which we are agnostic or turn a blind eye to the need that presents itself early on is the extent to which we will see the repercussions of it at a later point, likely in much more raw form, and will likely be much more traumatizing for the people involved. That's the case for health care, that's the case for housing instability, and everything in between. So the degree to which these partners are thinking more upstream as opposed to thinking in sort of this war zone mentality of I see need, I pull people off the streets, but I'm not thinking upstream about the pipeline of folks falling into this situation, is how you become short-sighted and you don't accomplish much. So now we're at this time where everyone in this room, I'm sure, has heard about the city of St. Louis is somehow from a city of significant blight in certain parts, a population that is diminished from a high of more than 800,000 people in the early 1900s to now 300,000 people, a region where approximately 2 million people exist, but not many people are new. We move around from one place to another. And we ask ourselves, oh, city got ARPA funds, and they have RAM settlement funds. Everybody's aware that St. Louis is somehow wealthy again. <laughs> who, who believes that? So we have $498 million of ARPA funds approximately, and there's still a fight about the RAM settlement funds, what will come from that, maybe a couple hundred million dollars. But what does that look like in a city where divestment has been in the billions, where tens and tens and tens of thousands of people have been neglected for a very long time at every system level, every system level? And it's codified in the way that the policy is laid out, the way that the structure is laid out. And so when I came to work for the city of St. Louis, my first question is, what are we here to achieve and what's our strategic plan? And so when we think about the unhoused space, 
we can't simply focus on HUD dollars, which Isaac and his team focus on. We have to think about the network of what uh, Andrew spoke to, and that's those who are falling into displacement and everything in between. And so prior to working for the city, I worked for the county, and so much of what thunder has been stolen uh, was me staying up late nights, uh, taking calls, which I still do to this day, uh, being very intentional about understanding the real plight of folks in the community and not just sitting in the office. It's very important for me and my team to understand the impacts that folks are feeling uh, so that we can ultimately deliver on things that are missing in some of those data elements. Because data can be looked at in many, many different facets. If you don't ask the question, you don't get the little deeper, then you can make assumptions that are totally incorrect. So that's why I caution people about data. If you don't have a group at the table that is informed, you can twist it for whatever your purpose might be. And so we're working in a system that's been under-resourced for some time, a system that has been backwards for some time. Uh, and so we're using some of this information to target. It's great to have resources, but without clear direction, it makes it difficult to really have the impact that you desire. So when I came to the city after having worked with Andrew and the RRT for now almost a couple years now, uh, I wanted to ensure that this was something that was not just here for the moment, but something that could be implemented and seasoned to inform future administrations, future people who might sit in my seat. Because again, the impacts have been happening from generation after generation. The extent to which uh, we don't think in those terms, that's the reason why politics and government doesn't work for people. We have to think about system structure change. So that's what we've been working on. Uh, and that's going to inform a lot of the decisions around some of this second allocation of ARPA funds. Uh, we've had a number of groups that have come from different communities that have been able to tell us various things, which have been informative. How you implement that locally does require, I think, someone with a footprint here that understands all the landmines. Uh, AJ um, neglected to mention that we worked together prior uh, in the county. And one thing I appreciate about her leadership um, when I was working with her is the ability uh, to understand the landmines. Because for those who are invested and directly benefit from the structuralized systems that don't benefit the people we're talking about, they throw landmines out like the Russians are in Ukraine. And they're just waiting on you to stand into them so they can blow your entire setup. And so I'm very mindful of that. I'm, I'm mindful about the intentionality of our work uh, to get past that foolishness, uh, and also by bringing partners to the table who actually are invested in seeing something different. So what you're going to hear, and I'm going to bring it a little home, is that what you'll hear in the next several weeks uh, where we're talking about those who are at the cusp or on the heels of the worst in housing instability is those who are unhoused and need to be housed. How many people think we should put them in shelter? By somebody calling out, wh wh where should we put people? Housing. housing. Well, this is a very informed group. Uh, if you listen to a lot of folks who are passionate about this work but sometimes are misinformed about how we get clarity, how we get a solution, they'll tell you we need more shelters. And that's like saying we need more emergency rooms without a primary care. That's like saying we need more emergency rooms without an inpatient floor. It's insanity. And so I'll say this time and time again, where we need to appropriate our resources going forward is around housing people and also preventing people from becoming homeless. I'll give you an example. I walked into this role a day before the first appropriation of ARPA funds we were given to our department, 
and the RFP uh, responses were all due. So I walk in on October 19th, October 20th, all the proposals are due. The Board of Aldermen in all its wisdom put forward all these line items that outline how dollars should be spent. And of the $30 million that was allocated under the first ARPA tranche, how much do you think went to permanent housing? 10%, 10%, $3 million total. And of that $3 million total, how many proposals do you think we got dollar-wise to support those activities? Not even the full $3 million. So you're ramming down money the throat of a non-solution. It makes no sense. So this next round of dollars, and of course, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. When they appropriate things through these legislative, legislative processes, it boxes you in as to what you can use those dollars for. So even though I can come in on October 19th and say I'd like to redirect in this way, legislation says no, 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 it's not gonna happen. So I have to wait until this second round. So anybody who is a city resident, hand raise. All right, I love these city residents. Because I want to see you showing up at the board bill hearings that outline we want more money going to permanent housing. Uh, that has been presented by our all. They told me I speak too long, so <laughs> I guess that's an indication. Um, but that means the board bill that was put forward by Alderwoman Shamim Hubbard, you'll be in support of acknowledging that that is the right direction to go and that's to put more dollars into permanent housing so we can house thousands of individuals, some of which you see out and about, but some that are right beneath the surface in these older motels the 5,000 students that are identified in the city school district as being unhoused, what are we specifically doing about this work? It's every avenue of connection that has to be integrated in a system going forward, and that's where we're gonna target the resources. That's how we're gonna use the data to inform that. That's how we're going to avoid waste of funds, and yes, waste happens. Nobody wants to tell you that, but waste happens because of these pet projects if I ask you, uh, if, if you, all you did was make widgets and I ask you, where do you think we need money? You're gonna say I need widgets, right? And that's the, that's the world we live in. So politicians say all the, all the people who are informing me need widgets. And so here we go on a widget hunt, right? Even though the rest of the community that's been on the outside said, damn it, I'm tired of these widgets. The widgets haven't done a damn thing for me. And that is essentially the insanity space that we've been in. So I, I implore anybody to speak up on behalf of finding and delivering real solutions to people. Not an organization, a nonprofit, telling the community to just reinvest in the same things we've been doing all along because it hasn't delivered a solution and I've been around the table for a long time. So I will stop there um, because I can't be very long winded. Thank you all. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I think I know there are probably a lot of questions and thoughts and excitement that came up um, after hearing all of our panelists speak um, and after hearing uh, Amin speak. And, and about six weeks ago, we all got together in a room with Amon, with folks of St. Louis County, and really started to brainstorm, given the rise in evictions, given housing investments that need to be made, given all of these policy and equity implications, what data do we need, right, to make sure that the, the public debates, right, the political debates are, are as valuable and pointed as possible? So um, I don't know if any of you wants the last word about what's next or what to watch out for. Um, and otherwise, we just really appreciate your time um, and we'll, we'll get to the next session soon. But yeah, any, any closing thoughts about what folks should look out for um, from the data space or policy space or otherwise? 
Yeah, so we, uh, we know that there's an affordable housing challenge. Last year, there was an affordable housing report card that came out for city and county. It told us uh, what we already knew is that uh, a number of people are overburdened uh, with rent costs uh, to maintain their households, and there's not a, enough affordable housing. What uh, is interesting is that I don't think there's a lot of analysis around what affordable housing is actually available, number one. Natural occurring, meaning that it is not subsidized and it's uh, your standard mom and pop landlords or other individuals that provide units that are affordable. So that's one component is a rental registry is, is something we're exploring with the city of St. Louis. Uh, secondarily, looking at the affordable housing that is subsidized, so meaning MHDC, which is the Missouri Housing Development Corporation, helps to uh, provide funding for low-income housing tax credit dollars every year across the state. And so ultimately last year that allowed for the rehab or the renovation and the build out of an additional 500 units. What they don't tell you, and again, don't get clouded by the top line number. The top line number tells you this is the number of ne units needed and this is the number of people who are struggling. But the question is what is already out there and what is it being utilized as? Oh. I got a report yesterday told me 1,500 units are sitting vacant just in the city of St. Louis. What are we doing with those? That's three times the amount that's funded on an annual basis by MHDC. So if we're talking about making an impact, why do we have to wait for another cycle to try to build more and go through all that when we're not potentially maximizing those vacancies that are currently online? So these are the pieces of the puzzle about asking questions about what's before you so you can make targeted interventions to change the reality. Okay, I, I don't know, that was not a bell that said we had to go, but let's, let's just pretend it is. So um, uh, thank you all so much uh, for being here today. Thank you, Amin, for your fantastic work. Um, yeah, applause. Okay, we, we are just gonna take a couple of minutes to um, get the, the next and final um, and, and thrilling last panel um, set up and running. So um, if you need to stand up and stretch your legs or, or grab some water, that's great. Uh, we're not gonna take as long as of a, of a break that, that um, we anticipated just to make sure we have enough time for that last conversation. Um, but thank you all again and uh, stay tuned for more at three.